Welcome everyone to the break here on CycleStream.tv. We're in our Los Angeles studio as we get ready for the 2019 season. I'm Dave Toll and this is my longtime colleague, Brad Soner. Well, happy to be here. We've got some amazing coverage coming to you here on CycleStream TV. And this is just going to be the first of many episodes of The Break where we'll have a chance to meet the people that really make cycling amazing here in the United States. Yeah, there's so many great events in this country that we just don't feel get their time in the sun. I'm really looking forward to heading to Tour of the Gila or maybe Gateway Cup would be a good example. But even more importantly, telling the stories of the athletes that make cycling so special. Brad, I've always called them the gladiators of the road. There's a reason. These are very brave people that have an amazing story to tell. Each week, we're taking a quick look at the racing here in the United States, who you should be watching, and where the American races are around the world. We hope you'll join us each Wednesday for the next 16 weeks. For now, it's time for the first show, so let's start with your Week in Review. We start in Redlands, where once again, Amber Neben proves her dominance throughout the five-day stage race, and an upset on the final day puts Corey Lockwood in the yellow jersey after shocking the Hoggins Berman action team on the last stage. Yeah, Neben won the opening time trial by 24 seconds over Lauren Stevens, and that really didn't change much throughout the rest of the week. Her defense was so impressive, withstanding a barrage of attacks, including a mighty one from Team Tibco. But ultimately, her Trek Red Truck team did a great job, and she ended up winning. Big stage win on stage two for the young Megan Jastrab on the notably difficult uh, Highland Circuit race. Jastrab outkicked the field on the uphill circuit finish for the stage win, while Krista Doble Hickok became the new GC danger at 39 seconds back behind Amber Neven. Jastrab, a 17 year old phenom from Apple Valley, California, who will absolutely have more big wins like this one in the next two years. Jastrab proves that she has an explosive winner's kick. And we're going to see that quite a few more times. It's a weapon, and she's starting to learn how to use it. Crit day on the penultimate day for stage four. Not much doing here. A nine-turn, one-mile course that has a history of successful breakaways in the past, and 2019 was no different. Six riders away in the women's race, and somehow Field fails to chase them back, setting up a scramble out of this group where Rachel Langdon capitalizes. Yeah, Langdon won on equal parts strength and smart. She had two Tibco riders with her to contend with in that break, both Emily Newsom and Lauren Stevens, but she dispatches both of them. GC gap got even wider for Amber Neben with a one minute lead into the final stage where Erica Clevenger checks out with a stage win, but more importantly, Neben made a group of 13 that had some GC threats in it, was able to contain them to win her fourth Redlands Classic. Big changes on the final day for the pro men after Hoggins Berman Action controls the yellow jersey all week. It started with Sean Quinn winning the time trial by a narrow one second on the first day, but he turned that over to his teammate Kevin Vermark, who held it all the way into the final day with a 24 second lead. But these guys had no idea what was about to hit them. Yeah, the two big stories here on the final day were Quinn Simmons and Corey Lockwood. Lockwood started the day 108 down on GC. He was in sixth place, but ends up in a break with Quinn Simmons and somehow Hoggins Berman after a crash early in the race actually let these guys get out far enough that they weren't able to bring that break back in time. Lockwood ends up winning on the stage but he leapfrogs Kevin Vermark on the final day to win the Redlands Classic by 1 minute and 25 seconds in historic fashion. Corey Lockwood was absolutely underestimated but he knew it was his day and he knew he had to deliver and he ended up putting his name on the Redlands Trophy. Stage win goes to Quinn Simmons who immediately jumps on a plane to Europe after Redlands and became the first American ever to win the junior men's Ghent Vevelgum. Megan Jastrup was second there as well, but she came off a good block of European racing. Yeah, uh, she won at the Trofea Binda as well. It was great to watch the young Americans leapfrog from Redlands over to Europe and have a success immediately. Well, they say Redlands is where legends are born, and those two legends certainly born last week. Good to see some American success in Europe. On to Joe Martin, we're heading to Walmart country, Fayetteville, Arkansas, for four days of stage racing in America's new hotbed of cycling, Cyclocross World Championships, headed there in 2020. Yeah, big news here is Chloe Dyer Owen is back. After suffering a major concussion at the Angentura, California last year, she's really been struggling with just getting back to the form that she had before the injury. She even missed the World Championships, but a TT win, the GC overall, I tell you what, she really turned over a new leaf. 
Dagger Owen wins the GC by 19 seconds over Tipco's Shannon Malseed, who also got a really impressive solo win on stage two. Looking forward to seeing uh, Dagger Owen in the Tokyo 2020 Olympic campaign. Remember, she got a silver medal in Rio, so things looking really good for the U.S. track program with Dagger Owen back on board. It was a big day for USA Cycling. It really was to have Chloe back on her game. Pro men, Stephen Bassett, the big time trial winner on stage three, a razor thin six tenths of a second ahead of James Pickley. That put Bassett in yellow with Pickley drifting back to 15 seconds back on the GC heading into the final day. Yeah, a tough uphill finish crit on the final day is what this race is all about. The Canadian Alec Cowan on the Floyd's Pro Cycling team gets the stage win out of a break of six as Bassett and his first internet bank team controlled enough to get Bassett his first major GC win at Joe Martin. Mountain bike racing last week as well on the Pro XCT calendar at Vail Lake out in California, the second stop after Benelli Park a couple weeks ago. World champ Kate Courtney wins on the long course and ends up second to Aaron Huck in short track. She now leads the Pro XCT calendar with 40 points over Huck. Chris Blevins was the big winner on the long course for the men. Third on short track to the Canadian Leandre Bouchard, the winner there, and second and fourth for the Pro XCT calendar leader, Peter DeSera. Yeah, what a Nike uh, success story. Kate Courtney is super cool to see her in the rainbow jersey here racing in the United States, and she's going to be heading up to Sea Otter next week. We couldn't have found a better first guest to have here on the break. No doubt about it, the credentials are amazing. He's a rider on the new Wildlife Generation team. He's in the mix to be in the Olympic Games in 2020, and he's a Coloradan. I'm really happy to have Colby Lang as our first ever guest here on the break. Welcoming Colby Lang to the show. Colby, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Excited. Yeah, I don't even know where to start with you when we talk about the Olympic team, wildlife generation, but I think really let's go back and look at your origin story. You're only two years into cycling at this point. Yep, pretty new to the sport. Uh, until here, I was skiing full time. So from the time I was a little kid, I was dead set on being an Olympic skier. My dad was a ski coach. And yeah, so from the time I can remember, I was always skiing and went to a ski academy and had no other aspirations other than to do that. Uh, I was skiing full time until I was 18. In that time, riding some, mostly to train for skiing and started racing locally, like at, say at 14 or something uh, and really enjoyed it. And throughout the years, got more and more interested into it. and. Yeah, basically, when I was 16, it worked out with my schedule for the first time that I'd get to go and compete at nationals, which was super exciting. Went and won. When you're uh, a kid growing up in the Vail Valley, uh, you look at uh, skiing, obviously, but then you have this tremendous success on the road side of thing, uh, junior national champion. How did you connect to the velodrome at that point? Well, after that, I definitely knew that I wanted to pursue cycling in some form, and originally it didn't really work out for me. And so we kind of transitioned to track cycling because it's my dad's idea, actually. It makes sense that for training for skiing is shorter, more explosive efforts. is a fun way to stay cycling and a cool way to compete, something I'd never done before. So I was super interested. And so, yeah, we just started making trips down to Boulder and uh, got really into the track thing. And from there, it's a blast. And that's where I got recognized as a cyclist. As we're talking to Colby right now, we're heading into Sea Otter. You've just wrapped up really a long a World Cup season on the track. Uh, coming back from Poland just, what is that, a month ago? Yeah, almost so, exactly. Right, so it's kind of changing gears right now. But let's go back again. 18-year-old Colby Lang ends up down in Colorado Springs on the Velodrome. Did they realize right away what uh, a talent they had? I mean, he's now on the uh, pursuit squad that's uh, you know gunning for Tokyo 2020. How quickly did they identify you as a real talent? Uh, well, based on some times I done, did at Boulder on that Velodrome, I got invited to this camp. And so... It was May of 2017, I was 18 years old, and yeah, I got to go to this camp with all these like famous American cyclists, Daniel Holloway, Eric Young, uh, people that even I, who didn't have a background in cycling, knew about. Throughout that camp, it became, I think, pretty obvious to some people that this is something I could do, and in the process, I was falling in love with riding the track, and 
by the end of that, it seemed like there was no choice. I, I was going to be a track cyclist. Boulder Valley Velodrome, what a great story for them. They build this track. It uh, almost gets destroyed yeah. and never built because of the floods of yeah. 2013. Yeah. And the reason they built this track was for somebody like you to live an Olympic dream. It's amazing how quickly the dots are being connected <laughs> here. So you then, uh, for people who are wondering, some of our viewers are going to be experienced track riders. What kind of times were you putting up? What's your kilo time when you're 18? In that, let's say, July of your yeah. Life. So I would have been, uh, I was 17 when I did the times that got me recognized, and I did a 105.9 standing kilo. Is that already then identified as world class at that point? Mm. I mean, guys have ridden now for perspective. Do you realize even then that a guy has done a one-minute kilo? Yeah, at that point... I had known just from watching YouTube videos what was possible, but I had no idea how good or bad that time was. Um, but the people at the track seemed to be pretty excited by it. Uh, then, <laughs> I bet they were. It, yeah. So immediately then, uh, what, what's the next step for you then? You ride a 105.9 at Boulder Valley Velodrome. How do they get word of this down in Colorado Springs? I don't really know. There's a few people involved that, like I said, were excited, and I think... Yeah, just through word of mouth, eventually got into the right ears, someone at USA Cycling. But uh, I, I've been super lucky, and Boulder's been ultra, ultra supportive of me from the time that I started there. And yeah, they definitely, and I consider myself one of their own. Well, you should. We're just now, as we're recording this, Boulder Roubaix was, I think, three days ago, yeah. right? And yeah. you win there going to the line with Colin Strickland. So yeah. I love the fact that really in your cycling career, we're talking about uh, a two-year period at this point. Talk to me. So Wildlife Generation, the yeah. team that you ride for on the road, was this the first time you've worn their kit racing? Uh, yeah, at any race of meaning, maybe some local races before that, but... Uh... Yeah, this was that was the first race that I had had any of my Wildlife Generation teammates with, and so that was super fun. Yeah, Sam Boardman, Max Chance, Max's hometown of Boulder. Yeah. Did you get to show you around? Uh, not in that instance, but I know Max pretty well from, yeah, he lives in Boulder, and I ride down there all the time, and that was the first time I'd met Sam. Uh, it definitely, after that day, made me even more excited to get going with these guys. All right, I'm going to go back then and talk more. So, you know, exciting things in your past and in your future, but obviously uh, in the last, it's a little more than a month now, the news of uh, Kelly Catlin hit the cycling community hard. I have to think that you having traveled with a couple of years, really your whole time in the sport, Kelly was with you. Talk to me about your thoughts about about Kelly's passing. Yeah. Um, well, obviously it's, it's devastating and it's eye-opening. She was one of the very most talented people on this planet, right, in all types of things between academics and athletics. Uh, really, really, really an incredible person and a huge part of our team. You know, you and Kelly really uh, were in the younger group of riders at USA Cycling, and I have to think men's team, women's team, there's a U.S. national team. Did you guys have a special bond? Totally, yeah. So Kelly and I were closer in age than a lot of the other guys, and you're right, it's definitely... That's our mono, actually, one team. And so the men's and women's team are definitely one unit. Um, and so we were close. If you're going to ride in her legacy, what, what, what would make you the most proud to, to have her look down and see you accomplish uh, on or off the bike? When I think of Kelly, I think of doing something absolutely fully 100% without any compromise. And so existing and traveling through life doing something to the fullest and to the very best of your ability is how she existed and how I think I would want her to watch me. How much did your perspective change after all of this on winning and losing and pressure and uh, was USA Cycling able to help you, the athletes around her uh, in such a tough time? Obviously you guys are, I think maybe the general public or certainly the cycling public realize these athletes are under a lot more pressure than maybe we realize. Yeah. Uh, a lot of pressure, and a lot of it's self-induced. Um, USA Cycling One did a great job reaching out to us and helping us with anything that we might have needed to cope with Kelly's passing. But yeah, going back to the pressure, a lot of athletes and guys on our team and women on our team do exist under a lot of pressure, um, which is, I think, only natural. Like their whole life is organized around this one thing, and. 
Uh, that's how they put food on the table and that's where all their goals are around. But recently, actually on this last trip that I was doing, competing with the national team, doing World Cups and World Championships, I had a major shift uh, in my mental state regarding sort of racing and race anxiety. Uh, I've been riding super well from basically the beginning of September through December, like better than I'd ever have, always improving and like feeling really good and really excited to race at these World Cups that were going to be in January. Showed up at the event and just started going slower and slower and uh, riding worse than I ever have relative to my ability. And I was in this amazing place, we're in Cambridge, New Zealand, it's beautiful, like amazing riding as with people that I really care about and are sharing this epic journey together and sitting on this massage table and just so unhappy that I wasn't able to <laughs> pedal my bike as hard as I wanted to. Uh, and in that space of being pulled from the team and not able to compete in New Zealand, I got all this time to sort of consider why I was so unhappy with myself and came to really the realization that like going to the Olympics wasn't going to make all this effort and everything I'm doing on this journey worth it and the number next to our country's name at the end of the ride wasn't going to make it worth it and the time next to it or how many laps I pulled in the race and feeling like a stud because I was super strong wasn't going to make it worth it to me and once pretty much anything I came up with trying to find what was going to validate my experience for me was around results and yeah, you know, once none of them actually were fulfilling I this massive pressure and weight was lifted off my shoulders because no longer was anything sort of superficial going to make it why I was doing it or why I felt good about doing it or what made me happy at the end of the day and ever since uh, I have been existing sort of without pressure and competing freely and doing it because I love it and because of all the reasons like how I'm involved in this team that 24 months ago decided that we're going to put everything into qualifying for the Olympics because we have a hunch that we might be able to do it and 30 people around us are putting everything into pursuing the perfect four kilometer ride for us and everything that goes into that is really cool but the number next to it at the end of it wouldn't have changed anything that I just did sure and so yeah since then uh, yeah like I said I have been racing without pressure and it's been really fun and it's a mental state that I hope to exist in for a long time. Let's talk about Boulder Roubaix real quickly. I mean, you ride a long breakaway. For those that don't know, these rough roads, or I should say, these are not uh, like your standard gravel roads. That day riding for, I would say, close to 60 miles with Colin Strickland, that must have been kind of spiritual out there. It's really cool. Colin's a great guy. It was the first time I'd met him was in the breakaway. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's this epic march. I broke, we broke away with a half lap into the race and it's a 72 mile race for basically three hours. It was him and I alone. Were you guys taking an even pulse, just swapping back and forth all day? Uh, for the most part, yeah. It's, it's, he's a beast He's too. super strong. Yeah, I mean, super strong. when you're looking at a day like that, because you're, it was relatively windy, uh, mm -hmm. you're in a small group mm -hmm. all day. What did your number, did you see your numbers after the I race? I did see my numbers and I was pleasantly surprised. Um, it was uh, it was definitely from a data perspective the hardest race I've ever done. I bet if you look at it minute by minute. So yeah. when you talk about the intensity of a four minute team pursuit, do you ride the in individual pursuit yep. as well? Yep. Uh, and your best personal best? Uh, top secret. Okay, but, so uh, what about your team pursuit best? Uh, the national record is a 353.7. And you were on that team. I was on that team. And and when you say your uh, personal best is secret, is that because it was done in training? Uh, no, actually, I've only competed in it once. Um, 
in a proper competition and it wasn't something I'm proud of. But okay. yeah, actually okay. my I, personal best is some in training actually. But. So when you talk about the bond that the team has, uh, it sounds like there's really two different uh, things to look at here. You have to make the Olympic team, but the Olympic team has to, or you have to make the Olympics as a nation. Uh, which of those is going better for you right now? <laughs> uh, I feel good about both actually. Good. Um, I feel good about my place in the team and um, something I'd say about that right off the bat is something that's been really important in our culture as a group is being happy for each other and yeah. wanting the best for each other. I think as soon as someone starts to get threatened about their spot on the team is when the wheels will come off. And so, but yeah, I do, I am riding well and I feel good about my place on the team uh, and then the program as a whole is in a really cool spot, actually, I think. That goes back to what you're talking about committing, though, doesn't yeah. it? You're either committed for this whole team or you're committed for yourself. Yeah, totally. And I bet you the coaches have had a lot of talks with you guys about that. To well, Team Pursuit in general is probably the most intense team event in cycling. It's four guys doing something that, in theory, is very controlled and traveling 12 months a year together, working on racing for four minutes at a time. Um, we live together and we train together all the time. And exactly. How do we stack up as a continental unit? Uh, we won last year, uh -huh. which was really fun to be a part of. Uh, I'd say right now Canada has the edge on us, but we're being so such a new program, we're certainly progressing rapidly, right. which is exciting to be a part of. Yeah, we haven't seen the ceiling yet, no, which is not most exciting. No, right? not at all. You've got Tour of the Gila to yeah. look forward to. Take Now your wildlife generation season starts. It's going to be fun, isn't it? Uh, the team's already really bonding. We're enjoying watching the team come together, and now you're joining. Yeah, yeah so Sea Otter will be my first uh, trip sort of really immersed with the team. and. Yeah, I'm super, super excited. It's an amazing opportunity for me. The situation that we've pulled together with Danny Van Hout and USA Cycling is something that is really, really exciting for everyone involved. I think Ashton Lambie, I was saying, if we wanted to make a movie a, a la Field of Dreams, <laughs> right? He's from Kansas, he rides around on a, a dirt track yeah. that he made. This guy's the real deal, isn't he? He is an incredible, incredible, incredible athlete. Um, and, and about as laid back as a person could be? Totally, yeah, yeah. super, super down to earth. Uh, just what you'd expect a Midwesterner to be like. So hey, Colby, good luck. Colby Lang joining us here, and thank you for joining us as well. Good luck. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs>